the outstanding Peter King, NBC Sports Football Morning in America. Peter, thanks a lot for being with us this week. Hey, my pleasure, Steve. How you doing? I'm doing well, and again, my best to Ann and you. I know last week was a tough week. So. Yeah, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, Aaron Rodgers, you've had a chance to know him over the years. That was almost surreal watching it happen on Monday night. A, what were your thoughts watching it, and then the reaction afterward? Well, Steve, uh, remember when we were kids in Enfield, Connecticut, and on Saturday afternoon there was a show, ABC, ABC's Wide World of Sports, and yep. we couldn't get enough sports, so whatever sports were on TV, <laughs> we watched it. Yep. And I don't know, they had surfing, they had cliff diving from Acapulco, they, they had all these weird sports from all over the world. I remember Jim Kay, who was the host, would always at the beginning yep. talk about the human drama of athletic competition. Yep. yep. And honestly, you know, sports is an incredible reality show, and football is sort of taken over as number one, number two, number three biggest sport in the U.S., it seems. And so if sports really is the ultimate reality show, then there's got to be reality. And sometimes reality bites. You know, sometimes it's just really, really hard to fathom, really, really hard to take. And I don't mean to make light or make just, a, 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 you know, how it really isn't that important and all that. It's it's obviously very important to a lot of people. They were crushed on Monday night. But if you are going to love sports and love the absolute, total unpredictability and capriciousness of sports, then very occasionally you've got to get punched in the gut. And that's what happened Monday night. And at the end, you would talk about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat as the ski jumper went yeah. off the uh, yeah. off the side. Uh, yeah, so, that's right. So now I want to get to Zach Wilson because Zach Wilson went through an off season with no pressure and went through a preseason with no pressure because he wasn't expected to be the guy. He was going to learn. What interests you about? Zach Wilson now being reinserted with the pressure upon him that wasn't upon him for the last eight months. I think one of the things that Zach Wilson has studied over the last five months is how Aaron Rodgers is the coolest guy in the room and um, how Aaron Rodgers doesn't really get uptight and excitable and all that. He just plays football and the game slows down for him. And, Steve, I, when I think of Zach Wilson, one of the words that comes to mind is frenetic. Mm-hmm. And what worries me about Zach Wilson, and I certainly hope that he's better than this, but I saw a lot of 2022 Zach Wilson on Monday night. And one of the throws that he made, the interception he threw to Matt Milano, was just so cookie cutter about what he did last year so often. He just made this kind of throw that said, what in the world are you thinking? He lost to the New York Jets last year, making two of those throws in the fourth quarter of the game that you just said, he can't play this guy anymore. Whoever it is behind him, I don't know who it is, but you got to put him in the game. Mm-hmm. And that's when they ended up playing Flacco and uh, and Mike White and all that. But I, Steve, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't know that just because you're around Aaron Rodgers that you become Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. And I just I'm skeptical that. Zach Wilson's going to be able to do it. Yeah, but so many times you end up being, you are who you are. doesn't matter who you're around, you are who you are. So, Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mike McDaniel, uh, I, had a, I had a chance to really talk to Mike when he was here for Penn State's Pro Day. And he's got a great personality, but he's also been through a lot to get to this point. Uh, what did you think of 
the performance of the Dolphins. Tua, who obviously at this time of the year, there about 11 months ago, people were wondering, would he have a career? What were your thoughts on watching that combination work together? Well, I think he's the perfect guy for Tua Tagovailoa yeah. because, you know, when he had Brian Flores, Tua knew that Brian Flores was not uh, totally in his corner. He liked him and everything, but uh, he just never felt, you know, he always felt like he wanted Deshaun Watson or he wanted the next guy, you know. And uh, I think when... Um, when Mike McDaniel was hired, he knew absolutely unequivocally that this team was all in on Tua. Now, it could be that Tua is not going to be able to stay healthy enough, you know, so that he's ever going to be able to uh, be consistently great. We'll find out. I mean, he's missed a month of each of the last two seasons because of injury. Uh, but, you know, what I say about that, I, you know, when I covered the Giants um, in the 80s, uh, in my much, much, much younger days, <laughs> you know, Phil Simms was thought of as an injury-prone guy. Yes. yes. Uh, because four of his first five years with the Giants, he got injured. But then he wound up being, uh, you know, basically Iron Phil. You, could, you couldn't get him out of there. And so I think it's too early to say anything about the long-term prospects of Tua and everything. But one of the reasons why he's so good with Mike McDaniel is that, A, he really wants to be coached and coached hard, and B, Mike McDaniel really doesn't have many sacred cows. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a clip, there's an NFL Films clip of him on the sidelines last year during the season, say, uh, saying to Tua just during a TV timeout, hey, I remember watching tape of you, like your early high school tape and all that. And he said, bro, you sucked. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you say, well, why? How does that help? Why does it? And, you know, you see the, the video and Tua is just laughing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes you need to cut the tension a little bit. And I think that's what he does well. That plus the fact that I think a lot of these coaches in the Shanahan, uh, McDaniel, obviously McVay, Tree, Matt mm-hmm. LaFleur, they can scheme people open right now as well as anybody I've seen in recent years. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and look, it helps to have a guy with the, the physical tools of, uh, of Tyreek Hill too, but they're really, really smart about having somebody open and, and, and oftentimes wide open on every play and if you're Tua how do you not love that yeah exactly and by the way Giants fans will remember Scott Bruner would have to step in for Phil Sims oh yeah yeah um, I have to ask you about Deshaun Watson we got obviously essentially an end of the season cameo last year how interested are you to watch the first six weeks of this season to see what he can and can't do in conjunction with that defense Steve, I watched a lot of that game on Sunday, the Cincinnati-Cleveland game. I thought it was the most interesting, entering the weekend, the most interesting game in the league. Uh, because on the one side, you had Joe Burrow, who, who showed, by the way, that he doesn't have all his athleticism and speed back by any means. And then you saw Deshaun Watson. You want to see... Is he going to be better than he was in his six games last year? And the early answer on him is is he wasn't. He was no better than he was last year. If you watch that game, if you could get uh, just a shot of all of his throws in that game, there's four or five throws that bounced way in front of his receiver. Yeah. yeah. And you're saying to yourself, man, where is the accuracy gone? For Deshaun Watson, he, it's like, you know, it's like, remember when Steve Blass started to aim the ball and yes. guys who have had the yips in baseball? Yep. I have no idea if that is anything what's happening here, but man, he's not accurate. And yes, absolutely unequivocally, I'll be watching him again this week. I'm really curious to see if he can get out of this funk that he's in. 
And by the way, love the 40-year retrospective videos. They have been really tremendous. A lot of fun. Oh, thanks. A lot of Thank fun. Thank you. Peter, thanks yeah. so much. Appreciate the time so much. And uh, we'll... Hey, no problem, Steve. Anytime. Hope everything is well and good luck this weekend. You going to Illinois? Going to Illinois, flying out tomorrow. Wow, good. Hey, good, good luck to the Lions. I appreciate it, Peter. Thanks so much. Take care. The outstanding Peter King. Yeah, football and basketball, football my good friend basketball. Brian Barnhart. Brian, how are you? Mr. Jones, I'm glad to be on with you. What a call by Bob there. Right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I hope they didn't have to give him a paper bag after that. That was kind of, <laughs> was kind of like, hey, come on. <laughs> He threw he need some lozenges after that one. Wow. He threw everything he had into it. Everything he had into it. Uh, so yeah. we will start wow. with this, Brian. Um, you've watched, you've you've seen it up close and personal. What has been the difference between first half Illinois and second half Illinois in each game? Illinois in each game. Well, uh, I think uh, part of it is the slow start. I um, mean, they just. Um, you know, against Toledo, it's interesting because the first drive of the year, Steve, they they drove down the field against Toledo. It was about as clockwork a drive as you'll ever see. I mean, it was it was perfection, and they jumped up seven nothing, and you thought, whoa, here we go. Um, and then they just stopped, and 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 they just Toledo uh, took over the game in that first game and uh, dominated in the second and third quarters, and it took a it took a pick six by Illinois, and and, and their new defensive uh, one of their safeties, Miles Scott to get them kind of back in the game a little bit. And then they took the lead, then they almost gave it back. And the, the overall problem in both games uh, was that um, the defense just is not at the level that it's been the last year and a half under Brett Bielema. And, of course, Ryan Walters is now the coach at Purdue. He was the defensive coordinator. And, and uh, four guys in the, in the secondary last year are now in the NFL, three of them drafted. And one was taken, of course, Devin Witherspoon in the top five. So, you know, trying to replace those guys – uh, you know, has been difficult in the early going, and there's some things you could do defensively, as you know, when you've got that kind of talent that you maybe can't do with guys that are still up and comers in that position. I think they can get there eventually, and I'm I'm pretty confident in Brett Bielema and his staff to to dig down and figure it out because uh, we had a game a couple of years ago, Steve, the first year that Brett was here. Virginia blew us out in Charlottesville, just ran over us, and uh, they made some big adjustments from that week to the next and went on the string of defensive excellence that we've seen over the last year and a half. So I think they'll get it figured out, but uh, the defense has been a problem from the start in both games. Granted, they face the preseason player of the year uh, in Jalen Daniels, who if you've not seen him play, uh, he is dynamite. I mean, he is unbelievably good. And then the kid at Toledo is, uh, well, they scored 71 last week, uh, Finn, and he's really good too, and a dual-threat quarterback. So, um you know, we, we've seen two really good ones. We're going to see another good one on Saturday. But it's been a combination, really, offense and defense, uh, slow starts in the first half, letting the other team get ahead, having to dig themselves out. Yeah, because uh, I did talk last week about the fact that Daniels is going to be back in the game. I mean, he just gave everybody fits with the way he played the game. Have you been surprised, though, at the ability of, of teams to – I know it's part of it's the quarterback – Teams have run the ball apparently better against Illinois than you expected. Would that be fair? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the you know the question in our in our community in Champaign Urbana and Illinois has been okay. Okay, what happened to our defense? Where did it go? You know, and mm-hmm. and because uh, we only gave up six rushing touchdowns all of last year, uh, you know, and already given up a handful already this year, and the other teams being able to run the ball. The defensive coordinator Aaron Henry, that was, he didn't even take a question yesterday. He just started with a with an opening statement saying, "Yeah, it's on me. We've got to figure it out. We're not gap sound. Uh, we're not uh, we're not tackling well enough. Uh, you know, we're we're getting pushed around, um, and and they've got to figure out. Uh, they got to do something different because giving up 31 points a game isn't gonna isn't gonna get it done in any league, and even in a Big Ten league where some of the teams in the West don't score a lot." I'm thinking Iowa and, and some others uh, in Minnesota, but um, you got to you got to score more than they're scoring, and you got to you can't give up 31 a game. And it's been just a combination of things. Um, now Johnny Newton had a really good game the other night against Kansas. He had Daniels cornered on a couple of different occasions, 
And in one play right at the end of the half, which was a backbreaker, Daniel scrambled away and threw a 48-yard pass to set him up for a touchdown at the end of the first half. So, And there was another time where Johnny had him trapped in the end zone and he got away. Uh, and he completed a first down pass on third and long. So Johnny's uh, Newton's playing really well. Randolph had a lot of tackles. But uh, there's just way too many tackles right now in the secondary. I think three of our top four tacklers are guys in the secondary. And it was just, you know, it's a combination of things, really. And um, they've, they've got to get it figured out. And Randolph got banged up in the fourth quarter of that game, right? Yeah, I believe he did. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And uh, Julian Pearl on the offensive line, that's been the other thing, Steve, is we we ran the ball so well last year. Yes. And you, you knew you couldn't replace Chase Brown completely because he ran for 1,600 yards and 2,600 over the last two years. But, you know, you, you've got Reggie Love, who's a good back, was a good backup back. He's got to step up. McCray was hurt almost all of last year. And the other two guys are either redshirt freshmen or just true freshmen. Uh, but the offensive line has struggled. They just, they've got a new center, uh, Josh Crutes, who comes from the great Crutes family with the Bears. I mean, he's, he's going to be fine. But he's new, you know, playing now, and we've had our two previous centers go to the NFL. So there's some changes there. The right side of the line has struggled probably more than the left, which is probably stronger with Isaiah Adams and, and Julian Pearl on that side. But, um, yeah, they've got it up, up front, as you know, is where you win games. And right now they're not winning up front. Toledo pushed them around, too. Yeah. Uh, and that was a problem, and, and they can't afford to do that. And then they're facing a really good Penn State team, of course, this weekend. All right. uh, something that's also happened too is that Illinois has become, uh, you know, because out of necessity, almost like a portal destination at quarterback. Um, and last year it was Devito, this year it's Altmeyer. Uh, what have you seen the pluses out of Luke Altmeyer so far through two games? Well, I would say two things. One is his arm is stronger. Uh, he throws a really good deep ball. Um, I think by the end of last year, teams had, especially in the Michigan State game and the Purdue game late in the year, and, and of course Michigan, but when it was close, but teams said, hey, we know you don't have a deep threat. You're not going to throw it deep, so we're going to take away your short passing game. We're going to put eight in the box. We're going to stop Chase Brown, you know, figure it out. And it was tough to score. And um, so I think what Altmeyer brings is, uh, you know, uh, he's, he throws a really pretty ball. Mm-hmm. It comes out of his hand really nice. He's got a strong arm. And the other thing is, DeVito was somewhat mobile uh, and would run when he could, but Altmeyer has already scored, really scored a 72 yard touchdown the other day yeah. against Kansas. Um, and he's not afraid to run and he's really effective with it. And he, and he gets down when he needs to. He doesn't, um, you know, let himself open to a big hit. And he's just a smart, um, calm, pretty quiet guy, but uh, you know has shown his teammates a lot of toughness, and they really re- respect him. Uh, Devito was a little more animated, uh, a little bit more like Brandon Peters, I think, before him. Sure. sure. Uh, but 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 Luke's impressed his team uh, with his the, with his demeanor, and he even in the fourth quarter drive against Toledo, where we were down uh, to come back and win the game, he winked at Brett Bielema on the way in and said, "I've got it. I've got this." And that shows a lot of confidence, and I think the guys have responded to that. Yeah, uh, Isaiah Williams. I mean, geez, I go back to the COVID game back in 2020, empty stadium. He was he was a handful when he played quarterback, and then they they did the smart thing and they moved him out to wide receiver. Uh, in this offense, is he really the go-to big play guy that Illinois is always aching to have? Yeah, they they need him to be big. He had 99 yards last he week. Sure did. Uh, and I was and he's uh, yeah, he's very fast. He's he's not the biggest guy in the world, but he's uh, he's fast. They try to get it to him with jet sweeps. You know, they try to get it in his hands. Uh, you know, with slant passes, they uh, you know they, they want to use him even more. In fact, Barry Lunny, the offensive coordinator, says we got to get it to him more. Yep. We need to make sure we get it to him. I think the guy that's emerged a little bit as a little deeper threat is Pat Bryant. Yep. yep. Uh, number 13. You'll see him. He's a big receiver, 6'3", and I know the scouts like him. And, uh, he can go up and get a ball. And, and then between him and Casey Washington, I'm sure you remember him, uh, had a great catch, uh, against Toledo to save us at the end of the game. Uh, diving catch about 30 some yards. And he's a really good hands guy. So, and the tight ends, they've been throwing to the tight ends more here this year. Uh, too, which is you would expect from a Brett Bielema offense. So, uh, but but Williams is you know he's the he's the uh, 
um, you know, the, the motor's engine. He's, he's the one that makes it go and stirs the drink. I mean, he's fast. He's, he's, he runs great routes. He's, he's really learned that wide receiver position. Uh, the only difficulty he has is like we had a 50 50 ball he battled for the other night against Kansas and the ball was taken away from him. Yeah. Just yeah. by a bigger, bigger secondary guy. But other than that, uh, he's got everything you want. All right. Let me ask you uh, about the atmosphere in, um, the stadium. What has the Bielema era done to juice up the fan base? And I know it's going to be an orange out on Saturday. I also know there are tickets available too. So, you know, what is the atmosphere like? Because I know what it's like to walk into uh, Assembly Hall, State Farm Arena, whatever the sponsor of the month happens to be, and, uh, you know, and, and, the, and then go to Memorial Stadium because. People in Illinois love their football. But, you know, obviously, Brian, you would know firsthand it's been a fight. So what's the atmosphere like now? Well, you know, it's funny. They sold 10,000 more season tickets uh, than they had last year. So that's, you know, that's a step up in the, you know, and definitely in the right direction. I know when when you're a Penn State or you're Ohio State and you're Michigan and you're drawing 100 and some thousand, uh, every game, that's probably just a, a drop in the bucket. But uh, for Illinois, that's a big deal. And to get that many tickets coming into this year after going to a New Year's Day Bowl last year. So I think there was some – this was about excited as the, the community's been about football uh, in quite a while, uh, ever since maybe the near the end of the Zook era, right after the Rose Bowl team and in 07 and that range. They won a couple of bowl games back-to-back in 10 and 11, but – Hadn't been that kind of energy in the community since then. So I think the atmosphere will be fantastic. I mean, it, it, the one thing that hurts a little bit is an 11 o'clock start as opposed to a night game. Yeah. I think our fans really our fans really love the night games. And to get the student body there, as you know, at 11 o'clock in the morning is a bit of a trick. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the other thing that maybe tamped down the enthusiasm a little bit maybe this week, and I think it'll still be there, but was the loss to Kansas and the way they lost, you know, being down so far. Now, they came back and made it fairly close uh, within, you know, about 10 points or so. But, um, you know, that was a little disappointing and a little concerned about the defense. And, um, and we've had too many years of, you know, having a really good year, and then the next year has been disappointing. And, you know, people are – some people that uh, jump on and off bandwagons, they go, well, here we go again, you know, we – we raised our hopes up, and now we're not going to be that good. And I'm like, well, I think we're still going to be really good. I have confidence in confidence in what Brett Bielema does. And uh, but he's been great about selling tickets and getting out there in the public. And he's on radio all the time, you know, promoting tickets and and uh, does a great job at our radio shows and mentoring, mingling with the public. So there's been a lot of excitement. And this is a, for football. And I think you experienced this a little bit, maybe in reverse too, with football and basketball, but. You know, if if basketball doesn't win twenty games, people are really upset. Yeah. You know, yeah. they really sure. get upset with the basketball team. And with football, it's like they're pretty easy to please with football. If you just win seven, eight, nine games and be competitive, um, be like Iowa, be consistent. You know, be like right. Minnesota, just sure. win, win consistently. Right. You'll win the fans; they'll show up in big numbers. You just got to prove that you can do it. And uh, that's the thing that Brett Bielema has talked about is bringing consistent success here because we just haven't had it. And I think he's got a plan for it. And uh, But, you know, again, they've got to figure out the defense, um, you know, as they get ready for Penn State. But the schedule the rest of the way, I think these are three of the tougher games they were going to play. Toledo, the defending right. MAC champions, and the favorites at Kansas. And then with you guys coming in, Penn State, after that, there's no Michigan, there's no Ohio State. Uh, you've got Wisconsin at home. Um, you know, you're at Minnesota. You're at Iowa. Nebraska's here on a Friday night. I mean, those are all winnable games mm-hmm. at Purdue. Uh, so the schedule kind of breaks out in their favor after this. If they could just get through this early sequence, they could still have a really good season. Pennsylvania has great high school football. So I'll leave you, everybody, on this. Illinois has terrific high school football, too. Uh, what kind of job has Brett and the staff done of making sure they solidify relationships within that state as pipelines on talent? Oh, they've done a fantastic job. I think that was the 
Um, well, well, the day Brett was hired it was the day we were playing out in uh, Happy Valley, uh, the COVID year, when uh, Lovey Smith had been fired and Rod Smith ran the team out there in Happy Valley, and then Brett Bielema got got hired uh, there in I guess December of 2020. Uh, and Brett Brett was at person. remember Brett was at the game at Penn State that they at flew the in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was at the game and. Uh, and that very that morning, he got hired by Josh Whitman. The very first call he made was to the head of the Illinois Coaches Association to say, "Hey, we're going to visit every school in the state, all the rural communities and downstate, Chicago and the suburbs. We're going to we're going to call everybody. We're going to go see them, whether you have a player or not." And now, at this time, going into this season of the 120 people that are on the roster, counting walk-ons and everybody else. Sure. Sure. Half of the team, half of the team is from the state of Illinois, which is a remarkable turnaround. Because I mean, I think it was in the low teens at one time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, under Lovey Smith, and that was the one thing that people that I heard because I emceed uh, high school coaches uh, inductions, Hall of Fame coaches every year, and I would hear the same complaint that you know Lovey Smith needed to interact more with us, you know, and recruit mm-hmm. the state, and 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 I would hear it from the coaches, so I knew the relationship wasn't good, and then. Um, but Brett Bielema has completely turned that around. So they've even hired a, a longtime high school coach in the state to be his director of high school football relationships. Yeah, yeah. And so they've, they've got one of their own respected coaches, Pat Ryan, um, is a guy who won, you know, some state titles and is respected in the high school community. He's their liaison. And they just did some things to really connect with the high school. And, and so now they're getting kids out of the suburbs that in recent years went to Iowa or went to Minnesota or went to Wisconsin and keeping those kids in home. So I think 59 guys are from the state of Illinois, which is a vast improvement. Brian, always a pleasure. I know you and I are going to talk here in just a few minutes uh, about a few other things, but I look forward really, my friend, to seeing you on Saturday. should be terrific. Well, it will be, and we're looking forward to seeing you guys too. It would be good to have Penn State in town, and I know our – our fans will be ready, and uh, Penn State's a big draw, and I've got more requests for tickets uh, for this game than I have in a while. So I think there's, hey, you got Penn State tickets? Yeah, yeah, I can. I'll work on that. So, <laughs> well, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have put that out there to the Penn State fan base, Brian. I mean, now they're going to call you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can text me, so that's fine. So. Once again, Brian's number is... No, I'm just kidding. Brian, (laughs) (laughs) appreciate it, my friend. All right, very good. Thank you, sir. Never a dull day around here. Never a dull year around here, quite honestly. Uh, Doing well. I was able to get back to Butler for my 30-year reunion before the season began, so that was a nice touch. That was nice. nice. Very nice. Very nice. And Other than that, everything uh, that was that was that was the pinnacle, and now it's all downward spiral. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you'd like to write about personalities and games. These aren't the things you want to write about. Uh, Michigan State had this in hand July twenty fifth. They claim there was new information. Am I being cynical when I think the new information is somebody got a hold of the report and they had to say something? You know, I, I I think the new information is that the USA Today story came out, and I think they were yep. Yep. not very clear about that um, because then they weren't very clear about the process. Um, the way that those investigations are supposed to work is essentially whoever is the boss of the employee accused of the things that Mel Tucker was incu- accused about, which would be the athletic director, Alan Haller, uh, is supposed to know that there is an ongoing investigation from the OIE office or Title IX office into your employee, and that's supposed to be the only details they know. And, you know, which is, you know, they, they, I don't believe in it, and the the interim university president said that Haller did not have a copy of the report in hand for any of those, or any of those details, and that the details were learned by the powers that be uh, when the USA Today story came out early Sunday morning. And as somebody, because because of what I do here at Penn State between teaching and so forth, I've had to take the Title IX test. So I, I, you know, so I do understand the process. I just don't understand that when the report is done, like it's July 25th, 
why and why it was kept under lock and key from people because at some point you have to make a decision don't you well but the report is only part of the process okay the, the hearing was the next step in the process which isn't scheduled until october 5th and 6th which happened to be michigan state's bye week uh which would have been the first availability for tucker to more or less go for the hearing uh had it got to that point where he was still uh, not suspended and and operating the football program as business as usual so that's the reason why it, it, it while the investigation from the outside part thir- uh third party attorney uh from ann arbor who handles title nine cases they they contracted it out for her to do the investigation just because the third party investigation was complete okay. didn't mean the process was complete because they still had the hearing and they still have the hearing scheduled for October 5th and 6th. Okay. Uh, perception means a lot. Uh, what does the perception of this do for Mel Tucker? I mean, you've read the allegations, right? Yep. Yep. I mean, it, 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 in the process here, it, it, working in, in Gannett and USA Today Network, you know, I was, I was, let known that there would be a story coming and the details of it to me were pretty fact of the matter that it was going to get embarrassing personally and professionally for tucker and for the university not just the details in in it but knowing the past history of things that have happened at michigan state from nasser to many of the other sexual assault and harassment things that have gone on around here outside of the athletic department. So there's, you know, the embarrassment factor and the professional factor to me are there. I mean, Tucker's response, and I've heard this from a few sources, that more or less it's good. It, it's just a matter of when. There's going to be a parting away. So it's the when and how. Is it going to be fired with cause and the university tries to get out from under the remaining portion of that 10 year 95 million dollar deal entirely which is going to end up being fought over in court or will they reach some sort of agreement between either now and and that hearing or after the hearing is adjudicated um you know the 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 it, it, it's a, a OIE investigation so you know when the university gets those details they could move then, and or they could ne- negotiate a buyout of or pennies on the dollar for it, and and work on a non disclosure agreement so he wouldn't talk about it. So there's there's a lot of moving parts I think still here before the ultimate separation takes place. And you know they could they could also in that negotiation process work it out so Tucker resigns. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of things beyond simply saying when are they going to fire Mel Tucker how long is it going to take there's still a lot of things to come with that well look there's still if my math is right about 77 million left on this thing Uh, right yeah right in their range so there's quote a lot for him to fight for and there's a lot for Michigan State to negotiate for if they decide to go that route fair yeah I think that's fair and you know that there's a lot on both parties, you know, from the other ends, too, in terms of are you going to be able to, how, how from Michigan State side, trying to get as much out of it, and, and also then determining is it worth firing for him for cause to try and get out from under it and cheaper to, to go into a protracted legal battle and right. try and bleed him in terms of, you know, monetarily a long fight for, for a coach that, thought he had $95 million in his bank and doesn't now. Harlan Bennett is going to be the interim head coach, but Mark D'Antonio takes a role within the staff. How interested are you in that angle of it? Very. Um, You know, Harlan Barnett is a guy who was on D'Antonio's staff, served as a co-defensive coordinator, played here. Uh, in college under George Perlis and yep. his defensive, his defensive coordinator here was a guy by the name of Nick Saban. I think a few people have heard of. Mm. Um, then he also, he also played for Nick Saban, uh, as his defensive coordinator with the Cleveland Browns in the early 1990s under a guy that some people may have heard of, this Belichick guy. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got a pedigree. This guy's got a pedigree and has been around some of the 
arguably two of the best coaches in the NFL and college football history, as well as the coach who has been around Michigan State. The best, many would argue that, that D'Antonio is the best, you know, with Biggie Munn and Duffy Doherty at Michigan State history. Yeah. Um, and bring, bringing back D'Antonio is really interesting because, one, the way he left, in February February fourth of twenty twenty, mm-hmm. <clears throat> after collecting his bonus, and right before the day before signing day, and after the coaches meetings that that they have annually, where you can usually find new coaches and find assistants and all those things, um, it, it left a sour taste in a lot of people's mm-hmm. opinions mm-hmm. of him at, at Michigan State, but those have seemed to vanish. In the the situation has come now. I mean, it's. I mean, it, it, they took eight days from the time D'Antonio resigned to when uh, Mel Tucker was hired, um, and you know that was a quick turnaround, and obviously a lot of twists and turns with Luke Fickle uh, reportedly having the offer to take the job and his wife declining it, which gave Tucker that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. So. D'Antonio, I think, is going to be interesting what his role is. They've said he's going to have a headset on. Um, Harlan yesterday said that it, a lot of it will be the calming presence of having him around, and I think the conciliary role in a lot of ways where he will bounce ideas off him. I'm curious to see what changes, because um, he did say that they've talked changes. So do they change schematics to go back to the 4-3 that D'Antonio is familiar with, with press corners? Maybe. I mean, both of those guys are very familiar with it, but I don't know about the rest of that staff because they've had guys that have, there's been a lot of changeover since Mark was there. So certainly a lot of things that, and we're hoping to get D'Antonio before the Washington game on Saturday, maybe on Thursday. Uh, but they've got a lot of things they're probably ironing out there. So I don't think that's, it, it, it's a, it's a, tumultuous week is to be expected here and we are we're not getting any players until the game after the game um so there's a whole other side of this that needs to be told but um yeah i mean it's you know you you go from celebrating moving to 2-0 and and mel tucker after the game saying we we ended our celebration in the locker room because we're ready and preparing for washington to yep. not even 24 hours Mel Tucker's gone. The kids are left trying to figure out in the process, and Harlan Barnett takes over. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I was at the press conference when Mark officially stepped down because they were playing Penn State in basketball that night. That's right. So, so I, so I was at the press. I remember the mood in there, and I remember the look on Mark's face. And the look on Mark's face was, "I don't want to do this. I'm just, I'm doing it." All right, but he, you could tell yeah. just by body language he didn't want to be there. Yeah, and I mean, listen, I, and this is to me, you know, Alan Howe, the athletic director. I asked him about this on Sunday. You know how this came about was, you know, Harlan and and Mark, and he said he called D'Antonio on Sunday, and D'Antonio told him, "I quote, Alan, anything I can do to help, I'm here for you." There's no chance to me that that was the first kind of conversation they had about this. Right. I mean, you're talking about a 67 year old guy who's in retirement. Um, I would imagine he'd had to run up by his wife. Yeah. You're not going to just all of a sudden hang up the phone and say, "Honey, I'll see you in 12 weeks." I'm going to coach football again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, I, and, and one thing that Alan Howard did say is they, he has contingency plans in mind at all times. You know, and, and you have to, particularly after the Tucker situation in 21 where LSU came in and made the overtures. I mean, if, if he leaves, if those were legitimate and he got an offer and left, they had to have a contingency plan for the moment and for the long term. So that's, I mean, that's what any athletic director will do. And for a guy like D'Antonio to still be in the good graces of the university, I believe at one point he was on a personal services contract. Um, so, I, and I don't know if that's still continued. I can't remember the, the parameters and length of it. But if he's still if he's still being paid, certainly there's something there. So, yeah, it's it, it's a chaotic and tumultuous time here. But you know, I think getting to the Washington game is. I mean, it's a big game. It's going to be interesting to see Michigan State in 
and really gets a little bit of cover for it not being on national TV. Right, right. It's going to just be streamed on a peacock. So the first time that's happened here, and it's a big game against Washington. So I don't know. Yeah. It's 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 going to be a fascinating Saturday, that's for sure. And one final question. I'm going to take you to the southeast. Uh, Michigan became the first team in the history of, of college football, I believe, to announce that they, or at least let everybody know it's a four-game suspension. Uh, and then the NCAA says no, and then they, so Michigan then reduced it to three. Uh, so, is there anything else that you're looking at in this Harbaugh situation other than he's done it three and the NCAA is just letting it happen? I, you know, I, I think that the NCAA will probably look to add more. It'll be interesting because if they do add more and if Michigan feels there'll be more added, what's it going to go? Is it going to expand to six games? So we'll get three games this year against non-conference opponents and three games next year against yeah, non-conference yeah, opponents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's the, what's the fairness in that? Um, and how do you adjudicate it? And you know, again, we talk about guys that might be going back to the NFL. Is Harbaugh even going to be there? at this time next year. I mean, that's always a legitimate question, but what's going to be wild? And think about this. Both of those programs this weekend are going to be led by interim coaches. Yeah, yeah. How crazy. crazy. I don't know if that's ever happened. Nope. How crazy is that? Uh, And that's exactly what's going to happen. You know what's really fun? When you and I actually get a chance to talk about games and players... Yeah, I thought for sure you were ch- reaching out to me to talk about the Richmond game. Uh, and and I had a lot of really great Richmond questions. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, most people do, but but I'm telling you, though, the Washington game, I've kind of made this analogy because I had no idea. You know, we spoke before the season. I didn't know what to kind of expect with this team. I, I kind of projected them to go 6-6. Six and six. This team right now... I mean, there are no expectations anymore, right? Right. right? So, how do you play? I mean, you could come out. Like, what if they end up being like, what if Harlan Barnett is Lou Brown and this Michigan State team becomes the Cleveland Indians in Major League? You're right, yeah. That's yeah. the analogy I keep going back to. Because <laughs> you got nothing to lose, right? Yeah. I mean, no one's expecting anything now. Would you like to be the head coach, Harlan? No, I've got a loop job coming up and also a, a tire change at 4 o'clock. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But I, 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 that's what I'm – I mean, you know, this Washington team's good. We all know what Michael Penix is from yeah. his time at Indiana. Yep. Michigan State especially. That's the other thing is Michael Penix torched Mark D'Antonio's defense in 2019. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he torched – Harlan Barnett in 2020 when he was still at, uh, when he was still at Indiana and sat out the 21 year because he was hurt and then torched him again last year out at Washington. So it's not like there isn't a compelling football thing going on either yeah. this weekend. Yeah. 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 And and the, and the wild thing is, here's the funny thing. D'Antonio was supposed to be back this weekend anyways because they're celebrating the 2013 Rose Bowl and, and Big Ten title team. Yeah. The 10-year yeah. anniversary. Right. And then here's the other side story. A little different capacity. And then the other side story is Washington's in the conference next year. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. Oof. Uh, well, well, <laughs> it's like another dull moment, right? Uh, uh, no like shortage of material. material. Yep, no kidding. Uh, but I do think this is going to, I mean, this, is gonna, this isn't going to be one of those things. With Mel Tucker, that's going to be done in an instant. There's, it's still going to drag out for for at least the next month, possibly longer. Mercy. Mercy. Okay. Chris, always a pleasure. Maybe next time, just for a couple of laughs, we'll talk about the players in the game. Yeah, and maybe we'll see each other in Detroit, remember? Yes. They're not playing here this year. Yeah. They're playing the last game in Detroit. In Detroit. In fact, so. I've already got my flight from Orlando in from basketball to do it on Thanksgiving night. So, yeah, I shall be there. Uh, well, we're looking forward to that. I'm sure we'll talk before then. You got it, too. Like you said, it never ends here. It never ends. Chris, thanks so much, and I hope the 30th reunion at Butler uh, was a good time. A good time. It was a fantastic time. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Thanks, my friend.